Shall we pray? Father, it's now your time to speak to us. I pray that through the Holy Spirit, you will reach our hearts and our minds with the truths of your word that will give us a passion for you. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. The account of the great flood in Noah's day holds many spiritual lessons for us as Christians today. For this story parallels the spiritual condition of our generation. And it gives us a glimpse of not only of God's judgment, but also his mercy and his grace. Did you know that there were only 10 generations from Adam to Noah? Think about it. Only 10 generations from the point when God created man perfectly in his own image until man became so corrupt that when God looked down, he saw that every imagination of the thoughts of men's hearts were only evil continually. Only 10 generations until the creator of earth and of mankind knew that he had to destroy them both. The account of the great flood is one that tells the story of both great wrath and yet of even greater mercy. And you know, as I pondered over this subject, I noticed something that I hadn't realized before. There are two chapters of Genesis devoted to creation. There are two chapters devoted to the fall of man but four chapters were devoted to the flood. I guess it means that there is definitely more to this event besides the fact that the animals went into the ark in twos and by sevens. You see, there's a very important message interwoven in this story that we all need to take a closer look at. In Genesis chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, reading from New King James Version, And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Many people look at the account of Noah's Ark merely as a story that we tell to children. Many times we fail to realize the vital message of urgency that it carries to our generation today. The Bible doesn't tell us all of the details of what actually happened from the time that God chose Noah to build the ark until the actual time the waters receded. It's just a, quite a short section. So if you will allow me, let us use our imagination along with our common sense and think about some of the possible untold details of this pivotal time in mankind's history. Now let's just imagine that we were there when God told Noah that mankind had become so corrupt that he was going to destroy them and the earth that he'd created. Now we could speculate that Noah probably wasn't too surprised at this because after all he himself had constantly witnessed the wickedness of humanity that he'd seen. And that no one feared the Lord any longer, nor did they even care to know him. I wonder when God first told him of his plan of destruction, did Noah perhaps think that it also included him and his family? 
But the scriptures tell us that Noah found favour in the eyes of the Lord. Now the King James Version translates this word favour as grace. Notice that here in the account of the flood is the first time that this word grace is used in the scriptures. No, Noah and his family wouldn't be destroyed. For it was through them that the creator would perform an awesome act of mercy. Now, God said, Noah, I need you to build a boat. Now, that seems simple enough, doesn't it? Or maybe not. But I can imagine Jonah's reaction. A what? I want you to build me a boat, a big boat. What's a boat? Do you know, I worked in the stores at a shipbuilder's years ago, and it looked quite complicated <laughs> building a boat. But it was essential that the workers follow every detail of the draftsman's drawings. Otherwise, it wouldn't work out. Now, this boat that God had asked Noah to build had to be constructed according to some very particular specifications. And Noah listened carefully as God said, let's make it 450 feet long. That's one and a half times the length of a regular football field. Let's make it 75 feet wide and 45 feet high. Or in today's money, we might say, that's 137 meters long 22.86 meters wide and 13.7 meters high. Now, in my mind, I'm seeing Noah's jaw drop to the ground at this point. Huge. Again, what Noah said to this isn't recorded for us. The Bible just says, that he did it. But I can imagine that some of us might have said in response, some of us might have said in response to these instructions, I'm a farmer, not a carpenter. Or I'm a nurse. I don't know anything about building boats. What do we need a boat that big for? We haven't got any water. Or they may have said, we might have said, you are God, you are almighty, you created the universe, it might be much quicker for you to make a boat. But you know, I don't believe Noah said any of those things. You see, Noah was a man of great faith. While all those around him were falling victim to Satan's alluring deceptions, he was holding fast to the hand of God. Isn't that what we need to do? And it was because of Noah's prior faith and obedience that the Lord chose to save him and his family. But not only them, but also to preserve humanity through them. From chapter 6, verse 3, we see that God sent Noah, set Noah a time limit for accomplishing this seemingly impossible task. God said, my spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be 120 years. What do you think went on during those 120 years? I'll tell you what happened. Picture in your mind, if you will, in a land that had never before seen rain, far from the water's edge, this man and his family began constructing the most immense seaworthy vessel that had ever been built. Noah exercised immense faith, didn't he? <clears throat> With every tree that was cut down, 
With every peg that was driven into place, Noah sent a message from God. And the message consisted of two parts. One of God's judgment and the other of God's mercy. You see, as Noah day by day, week by week, year by year, decade by decade, labored in building this mighty vessel, he also labored as a preacher of righteousness. That's what he's called in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, a preacher of righteousness. I can imagine the people around him hurling insults at him and making fun of his endeavours. Ha! Where are you going in this thing then? Where's the water? But you know, I believe maybe at first some might have been convinced with Moses' message. You know how it is, sometimes people will start to believe like the seed thrown on the ground, it starts to grow, but then Satan comes and snatches it away. And some may have indeed been willing to listen to Noah's message in the first place, and maybe even help them with the building of the boat. But as time went by, they didn't see the changes or any signs of change in nature or even a drop of water. And they eventually drew back into their state of disbelief that they were in before. And as the completion of the ark drew nearer, the obstinance of the people grew as well. They continued in their wickedness, they wallowed in their disobedience and seemed to enjoy taunting the crazy old boat builder. But even then, I imagine that Noah continued to preach and plead with all who would listen. You know, we have a saying, or there's a hymn, there's room at the cross for you. I imagine Noah repeating another phrase over and over again, there's room in the ark for you but no one would listen. Even those who perhaps may have given their labor in the early years eventually chose to harden their hearts and reject God's warning. How in the world could these people not believe the preaching of Noah? Again, in our imaginations, let's go there. Let's imagine that we are in the crowd of those who are casting insults at Noah and his family. The ark is now completed. The only door is open, forming a ramp by which those who choose to do so may easily walk into this great uh, cypress or gopher wood boat. But at this point, inspiration tells us that the animals led in pairs by unseen angels, calmly and orderly came to Noah to be boarded onto the ark. Just think about it. Seeing animals of all species, both ferocious and docile, walking, crawling, slithering, flying right past the crowd of unbelievers into the boat. Shouldn't this have told them something? That's how hardened their hearts were. This should have told them something is happening. But by this time, the unbelieving spectators were so hardened against the truth that then they made no decision to repent and accept God's offer of mercy. But rather, they tirelessly continued in their assault against this man of God and his message. In chapter 7, verse 16, the Bible tells us that once Noah and his family and all the animals were aboard the ark, that the door was shut. Now this is very important. 
Noah didn't shut the door. His sons didn't shut the door. And the elephants weren't used to pull this door, this huge door shut. The Bible says Yahweh, God himself, shut and sealed that door. And when God shuts and seals a door, no one else can open it, only God. The Bible says that they were inside the ark for seven days before the flood waters came upon the earth. I can imagine the doors now shut and the people after the first day, the second day, the third day and so on, <laughs> where's this rain that this stupid man is talking about? But the family of Noah was safe in the ark. I imagine that the crowd were still carrying on with their revelry and their idol worship, perhaps using up some of the wood from the left over from the building of the ark to offer their sacrifices. They went on eating and drinking and partaking in all sorts of revelry as they had never as if they had never heard a message from God. The sounds of amusement soon faded though when something occurred that had never happened before. It began to rain. Can you imagine the crowd standing there and starting to see water dropping from the sky? they have never seen anything like this before. A dead silence fell over the crowd as they looked upward and saw this water started to come down out of the sky. <clears throat> in the book Patriarchs and Prophets page 450 we read these words the world before the flood reasoned that for centuries the laws of nature had been fixed the recurring seasons had come in their order heretofore rain had never fallen the earth had been watered by a mist or dew the rivers had never yet passed their boundaries but had borne their waters safely to the sea. Fixed decrees had kept the waters from overflowing their banks. These people were accustomed of the ground being watered by a heavy dew, never rain. Horrified, they wondered, is what Noah said true? Is God sending a flood? They'd seen this boat being built, they'd heard his message, and they refused to listen. But now the rains were coming heavier and heavier. Noah preached this message for 120 years. I'm sure many ran to the closed door and started banging on the door, pleading with Noah to let them in. But it was no use because God had closed that door and only he could open it. Unbelievably, some were still unmoved by what was transpiring before their eyes. But then the heavens were opened, the floodgates of the heavens, and the earth violently burst open in many places, spewing water hundreds of feet into the air. It was now evident that in a very short time the earth would be completely covered. Now all those that were outside the ark desperately wanted to get in, but it was too late. It was of no use. Noah and his family could only try not to hear the desperate cries of those perishing outside. Do you know the waters reached approximately 25 feet above the highest mountain? That's 7.6 meters above the highest mountain. And so in a short while, the only living souls on the earth were inside that ark, floating safely on the raging waters that claimed the lives of every other living creature upon the face of the planet. 
Noah and his family were alive because through faith they built and entered into the boat that would eventually save them. Do you know, when I was in school, I wasn't very interested in history. I thought history was boring. What do we want to know about what happened years ago for? But you know, now I appreciate history. And history has a way of repeating itself, doesn't it? And we can learn something from the successes and mistakes of others so that we don't make the same mistakes. Wouldn't it be a wise investment of our time to look back into history and learn from it? That's why we have the Bible, isn't it? Friends, the story of Noah's Ark is without doubt a parallel to what will happen in this generation. I don't know about you, but I for one believe that in my heart that Jesus Christ is coming back and I believe it is very soon. Have you, I'm sure you've seen what's happening around the world. Have you ever seen anything like it in your life or in anybody's lifetime? When I looked at that map on the news of Australia and all the areas that, of fire that there were, and I looked at that and I thought, do you know what? The whole of the country could be wiped out if it continued to go that way. Never seen anything on that scale. We've heard of bushfires before, but nothing like this. And the floods, horrendous. Jesus told us that this would happen as the time became nearer to his coming. When we say to people that Jesus is coming back again soon, people are often quick to remind us that they've been saying that for years, forever. In a sense, I can identify that with that because, in fact, some of the, the apostles kept the hope alive that Jesus would return in their day. But obviously, he hasn't returned in bodily form yet. Let's take a look at what Jesus tells us in Luke 17, verses 26 and 27. He says, Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving, given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. Do you know, something amazing happens to us when we realize God's amazing love for us, doesn't it? What an amazing God. What great mercy he has shown to us. When we accept his sacrifice on our behalf, and when we begin living by the spirit rather than by the sinful nature, we inherit a certain outlook on life. And we're saddened when we look around at those who live and act in a way that it seems they're not even aware that there is such a loving God in heaven that is pleading with them to come to him and to have true life, eternal life. I can imagine in some sort of way it must be how Noah must have felt. Why? 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 As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Friends, a major difference between what happened then and what is in store for us is that this time there is no literal boat. You see, Jesus Christ is our only vessel of salvation. And just as it was back then, no one is going to forcibly put you into this vessel. You have to make that decision yourself. Our loving Heavenly Father gives us the power to choose whether we will accept his offer of salvation or not. Whether we will get on board and choose to remain where or choose to remain where we are. 
friends, there's an urgency involved in making this decision. But the problem is that today we are much like those in Noah's day. We simply don't see what the hurry is. But before they realised it back then, the door was shut. And unfortunately, they were on the wrong side of the door. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 3 to 6 says this. First of all, you must understand that in the last days scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. When will our door to salvation be shut? I'm sure yourselves like me and probably thousands of others, we were shocked to hear of Andrew Davis' Andrew Davis's death. He was 38 years old, full of energy. Just a couple of days before he died, he was, lead, he was preaching a, a big youth event. Two days later, gone. We don't know when our time is up, do we? We can't think, oh, I'll wait until next week when I've got this done or that done. <clears throat> oh, for sure, the door will be shut to us before Christ comes. The scriptures are very clear that he will return much like a thief in the night, very unexpectedly. Yes, the door will be closed on humanity when Jesus returns in power and glory and majesty. But as I said, it may very well be closed for us before the sun goes down. We just do not know. You see, when we die, the door is closed for us. We are either in Christ or outside of Christ. You know, there's a popular misconception of how we know where we are, in or out. Some think that just because their name is recorded on some mem church membership roll, that's also inscribed in the Book of Life. Let me just remind you that there may have been other people helping Noah in the early days of building that ark. When the time came, they were outside the door when it was shut. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, friends, Noah had an urgent message from God that was indeed a matter of life or death. We too have a message from God. And like Noah, our faith and love of the Lord should encourage us to share this message. This message of hope, doesn't the world need hope? It doesn't matter what part of the world we look at, whether it's political or physical or whatever, the world needs hope. And we have a message of hope that we need to share. Like now, we may also experience scoffers and be ridiculed and made fun of. But like we had in, said in the children's story, we may have to stand alone for God against opposition. Because the dark clouds of destruction and wickedness are indeed gathering. We can see it all around us, can't we? The time is short. And whether we're ready or not, the Lord is coming. Let us make sure that we are in Christ, the vessel of our salvation. My prayer is that God will richly bless you as you seek to draw closer to him. For his name's sake. Amen.